2001 Toyota Echo with a 1.5 liter engine. We have a real good case study here. Certainly vehicle history is very important on any car we work on. This car came from an auction and it had a bad engine. The engine was replaced with a junkyard unit and the junkyard engine ran and it ran okay but it was blowing white smoke so the junkyard engine actually had a bad head gasket and it was replaced again and they put a 2004 engine in it and once they bolted this 2004 engine in the car never ran right again it would start on occasion and then not start and somewhere in the process sensors were replaced and components were swapped and they ended up replacing the engine computer and the reason the engine computer was replaced was because of a no communication problem after the computer was replaced the car would run again for some reason but it still wouldn't communicate so then it went to the dealer and the dealer basically didn't want to touch it is really the word that I got it wasn't that they spent a lot of time on it and couldn't fix it it's just understandably they didn't want to touch it the car wouldn't communicate for them either and they basically washed their hands of it and so I said sure we'll take it up here at Rosedale Tech no problem we love these ones for a good case study so we take the car on and I'm going to show you the symptoms and the check engine light and see if we can read trouble codes out of this car next okay I'm in the car and I have the key on and I want you to notice that the check engine light right now is kind of pulsing on and off a little bit and also I've tried to communicate with this and I am getting a no communication your next steps involved are typically to check pin 16 on the data link connector for power and check pins 4 and 5 for a ground and that is pretty standard across the board and we'll do that but I want to start this car now and see if I can show you what the check engine light does when this car is running and it does run it certainly doesn't run good having a hard time keeping it running it barely revs up check engine light comes and goes flashes on and off and the flashing of this light is certainly not misfire related this is definitely something different Okay, so you heard how the car runs, check engine lights acting goofy, we have a no communication problem. And depending on the vehicle, depending on the symptom, with a no communication problem, I may attack this problem first, or I may not. Let's say the car comes in, has a single cylinder misfire, and you can't communicate with it, do we want to spend our time with a no communication problem, or do we want to attack the misfire? they might not be related and what I found in a lot of cases is they're not you can have a no communication issue and have a perfectly running vehicle I think in our case though our no communication problem is tied into our issue in that our check engine light is flashing on and off and continues to do so and even with the key on it tends to flicker and change brightness and based on the symptoms of the, of the car too that both computer systems both computers that were replaced did not communicate and that this problem started after an engine was replaced okay one of the things that I do when I have a no communication problem that goes beyond checking pin 16 for power and pin 4 for a ground is I need some help and what I've done is I've pulled up a piece of information and this is from Mitchell on the data link connector on scan tool problems so it was under a heading called scan tool problems and there wasn't a whole lot of information on this vehicle apparently Toyota 
didn't release a lot of information, not sure. But this is all I have as far as communication problems on this vehicle. And you see in this chart that it's telling me to check for loose damaged terminals and actually make sure the terminals are in the right position. I'm not sure why they would be out of position unless someone was there. Certainly though, pins that are out of position for us really isn't a concern because this vehicle also exhibits a very bad running condition. This isn't just a communication problem. So we want to be clear about that, that we're attacking more than a communication problem here. But we believe our communication problem is tied into our running problem, and so that's why we're going to stay on this path. So the next thing they have you do is checking resistance and checking for power, checking for ground. And you see in this chart that pin 4, pin 5, this is a signal ground for pin 5, pin 4 is a chassis ground, and both of these should be 1 ohm or less. Pin 7 is our bus communication, and pin 16 is our battery voltage. So I've already checked these, and I'll show them to you very quickly on the data link connector. Pin 16 is good, my two grounds are good, and we're going to focus on this pin 7 bus communication circuit, which all they give me is a footnote here of one so underneath it says it is it says pulse generation should exist during information transmission from engine control module ECM. So that isn't really very descriptive pulse generation. I don't know the voltage levels on this circuit. I don't know if I'm going to be see, seeing 05s, 010s, 012s. I'm not sure what type of signal should be here, but at least it's a guide and it helps. So I'm going to take you to the data link connector next and show you what these pins look like. And just to review with you guys how important it is to have a good ground on your meter that you're using and I chose under the dash a metal bracket and a stud and that's great but we can't be 100 percent reliant on that without testing it so before I would ever check my grounds on this data link connector I want to check my power first and that's going to do two things. One, if I have voltage on pin 16 and it's good, that's also going to tell me that my ground connection is good and I can go ahead and continue with the rest of my testing. So pin 16, I have a little chart just to be clear on where pin 16 is. Pin 16, depending on the position of the data link connector of course, is either going to be the top left or it's going to be the bottom right dependent on which way it's positioned and it looks like on this design that the fat part of the connector is at the top and so that's going to put pin 16 right here it's going to be opposite of what we're looking at here so I'm going to go to pin 16 and we'll see what we have now I'm using a T-pin and a multimeter connection what we don't want it to do and I just see this too much in the field is is people will take a paper clip or t-pin and they'll stuff it in that connector and when they do that the data link connector when you connect the scan tool it never fits right again and you have communication problems so spread terminals we don't want to do that do not stuff that pin in there all I'm doing is I'm just touching the end of that clip and we'll get a reading on our tool and you see I'm at 12 volts so I take it off you see I'm dropping to zero and I put it back on and I have 12 so that confirms that my battery voltage feed to pin 16 is good and we can continue with our test okay so continuing what we want to do is address pins 4 and 5 and you can see that pins 4 and 5 on this data link connector they're giving us a spec of 1 ohm or less and that would be connected to ground. These are ground, so I want to keep my multimeter ground connection where it was. And we are confident that that is a good ground because of our last voltage measurement. So whatever we have on these resistance measurements, we can rely on. Something to pay attention to is what tool you're using. I am using a Snap-on Varus and to use the ohm meter for the Varus, you can see that channels 3 and 4, there's a little ohm symbol between them. I must move my multimeter leads between these two. For the ohm meter, it really doesn't matter where you put your leads. Ohm meters are not polarity sensitive, so it doesn't really matter which ones. 
and certainly they don't need to be color coordinated. But I am now set up to use the ohm scale. Go back to the tool, show you how to do that real quick. And I'm just going to exit out of where I am. And over on the right here, I'm going to select ohms. And I've already calibrated my, my leads. What we would do is connect them together. I'm going to skip that part. And all the clicking you're hearing is just some auto scaling. And right now it's showing that it is out of range on the lowest scale. That should be mega ohms. I'm not sure why it's not. I'm going to go ahead and touch on pin 4. And again, we're, we're upside down here. So pin 4 and 5, it's going to be like this the way we're looking at it. So it's going to be four and five and I'm going to do a simple ohm test pin four again I don't want to spread these pins apart so I'm just going to touch it there and this is pin four I'll get you focused on the there's here in a second so there's my pin four connection and you can see apologize for the light you see we're at zero ohms on pin four. I'm going to take that off of pin four and I'm going to go ahead and move it over to pin five. This is pin five. And this thing is auto ranging and you see we are zero ohms on pin five. So our pin five ohm check to ground, our pin four ohm check to ground showed that we have good grounds on pin four and five. We have a good power on pin 16. And so what we're dealing with is not your conventional communication problem. What we are dealing with is something beyond a typical power or ground problem to the data link connector. And we have to go a little further. Okay, so based on our little flow chart that we had, pin 7, if you remember, they told us that we should have a pulse generation it says pulse generation should exist during information transmission from the engine control module. So I should have some type of pulsed signal on pin 7. Get you back down on my, oh, forgot to say, that I am on the back side of this connector for a reason. I'll show you here in, in a little bit. But for now, I just want that on that wire and I don't have to hold it and I'm going to keep you focused on the screen. So I'm just back probing the back side of pin 7 on the back of the connector. Focus on the screen and you see that we have no voltage at all and this is a problem. This isn't what it should be. We should have some type of pulsed signal here but again we have to pay attention with what we're doing. One little step you mess up here. We're still on our ohm scale. You got to think about the tool you're using. We have to move this back to voltage on channel one to get a reading here. Just little steps that people miss along the way. Pay attention to what you're doing. And there is our signal on pin 7. And I know some of you are going to be thinking and asking me, well, what should it look like? And, and truthfully, I don't know. I'm not sure what the voltage level should be on this. I know that according to the diagram, it should be a pulsed signal. Looks like there's some kind of activity there but it certainly doesn't look like anything that I would expect to see. Uh, I can show you what that looks like with it running if I can start it. So pretty much the same, not a whole lot different. So the next thing that I want to do is I want to look at the data link connector wiring diagram and see what all is shared on this network. Maybe we have something shorted out, something's crossing over into this data bus and it's shorted to voltage. So we have a wire from another circuit. I have no idea. I'm going to pull that diagram next. Okay, so here's the computer data lines wiring diagram and I've already mapped out pin 7 on the data link connector which is right here and that's the one again that I am told to check on this scanner problems flowchart if you want to call it that. So pin 7 runs this way from the data link connector which is right here through a junction block behind the instrument panel and that really isn't a computer it's just a jumper and it runs down from there to the 
engine control module. So this is the engine computer and it splices to the ABS computer and then also down here to the airbag module. So we have the airbag, ABS, engine computer all talking on this one data bus network. To save time, I'm not going to show this part, but what I've done while monitoring my voltage on pin 7 on this data link connector. So I am on pin 7, this white wire with my meter and I'm seeing a pretty much constant 10 to 12 volts and what I did again being concerned about some type of short to power in here affecting this network is I unplugged my airbag system first and I got that out of the picture and it stayed at 10 to 12 volts so not only was I concerned about wiring I'm concerned about modules too I've certainly seen modules sort out and do crazy stuff unplug the airbag module stays at 10 to 12 volts next thing I did is I looked for my ABS control module to unplug it and ABS does not exist on this car so that eliminates that particular one and then I came up here to the engine computer and I unplugged the engine computer and when I unplug the engine computer this drops down to zero volts on this network and so what that tells me is that nothing in here the wiring integrity of the network is not shorted to voltage and that really my focus is toward this engine computer as the problem. Now it certainly would be nice to have some more information on what this signal should look like. Unfortunately I don't. I looked for more. Let me show you what I found. Okay and what I found is called a pin voltage chart. These are very valuable and in this case unfortunately it's not complete the computer numbers are up here so it shows you the connector and that's very helpful for what we're going to be doing which is checking powers and grounds but within this chart it gives you pin numbers what they do and what the voltage should be unfortunately though I'm not a Toyota mechanic so I don't know what all of these abbreviations are and really what I need to do is be able to find pin 7 on the data link connector and where it goes to the engine computer so I'm using another diagram to do that that's the one we had before this one right here my pin 7 on the data link connector which is this one goes to pin 16 on connector E4 on this computer pin. So you might be thinking, well, what's your point? Well, I want to know on this pin voltage chart to guide me onto what type of square wave or pulsing signal I should have to help me. What type of voltage should I have? So I'm trying to use a pin voltage chart to identify that and that's connector E4 pin 16 and I want to see if I can find that. And then it also, like I said, these are coded and this says S, hard to see on the camera, this says S-I-L is the abbreviation of that. So just to give you an idea of this chart, you can see that VC, VC, I know some of these from working on Toyotas over the years, that VC is your 5 volt reference circuit and THA is your intake air temp sensor circuit and you learn some of these over time. There's, there's some other ones that are familiar, IGT, those are ignition signals. So nothing in this first list for SIL. Second list. And oh, and again too, it also gives you the the connector number and pin number. And so nowhere in here is the E4. So I'm looking for E4 pin 16. Nowhere in this first chart is E4 pin 16. Second chart. This is all we have is two pages. And it has no designation for that pin and we have no designation for SIL as a code or symbol and so what that means is I do not have the information that I'm seeking on this signal and what it should look like I don't know what the voltage level should be on this circuit all I know is it should be some type of on off pulsing signal and I do not have that Although the other thing too though is it said during communication 
well, I can't communicate with it. So I don't have anything there. We pretty much have a flat line, although it's got some squiggles to it. And really our direction right now is we're going toward the computer as the problem. And again, that was due to the fact that I unplugged the engine computer and this voltage drops down to zero. So I know my network is fine. My focus is toward the engine computer. And our next step is going to be powers and ground tests on the engine computer. Okay, so we're going to do power and ground tests on this computer. Doing power and ground tests, it certainly helps to have a good wiring diagram. And again, I'm using a Mitchell. Mitchell on demand is the wiring diagram that I'm using. And I'm, I can use this pin voltage chart so I can go through these and find out where my battery voltage and, and, and uh, grounds are. But the problem is I need to know these codes. And I'm not a Toyota guy, but I do know over the years of working on these that E1s and E2s are typically computer grounds. So we can use those codes on here, although I don't see any grounds listed on here, which is kind of interesting that they would have other pins but not a ground. So I pulled up the regular diagram, and unfortunately on, on this, again, they're coded. They, they don't give you on this particular diagram the internal guts or designated circuits. I like our domestic ones because they'll say, power, they'll say sensor ground, they'll say signal return, and they give you a description. So again, coding is important and it helps to know that the E1s and E2s are grounds just from experience, but what you would have to do if you didn't know is you'd have to go line by line and follow all these, see where they go. I've done that already. There's two main powers that I want to focus on. That's this pin here and this pin here. This one is hot all the time and this one is hot with the key on. Our main grounds are down here, and these are designated E1, E01, E02, E03. So that's the designated codes. All of those grounds are shared. Well, they're not all shared together. There's two that go here, and there's actually, and I want you to remember this, there is an idle air control motor that shares this circuit ground too. Keep that in the back of your mind. And then there's another ground location over here. So multiple grounds we want to check. I'm going to take you to the computer and we're going to check those. And the hard part about checking them at the computer is are you on the right pin? And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at sequencing of colors. I've shown this before in some of my other videos. When I look for this particular brown wire, I'm going to look for a black red white right next to it. And I'm also going to go by the number of pins on the connector. And then, of course, when you have one like this, which is our pin voltage chart, that what we can do is we can find those pins on here. And I marked them up already. So my yellows, 1 and 12, are my power. And my grounds, 1, 13, 26, 15, 14, those are my grounds. Now, again, just to save time, I'm not going to show the power part. With the key on, this would be key on engine off connect your multimeter voltmeter to a known good ground we're going to do voltage checks my two powers showed good battery voltage so i'm reading 12 volts on both of my power feeds so what i want to show you guys is the grounds on this computer okay so i'm at the engine computer now very nice design actually on this one i wish they were all this easy to get to this one's just right under the glove box on the passenger side and it's pretty open already. But we're going to take some, some new signals and when we're doing new signals in new locations, of course we moved our ground to a different location. And I can't stress this enough how important it is to make sure that that ground connection is good. And we just simply don't know that yet. I mean even if it's, even if it's on a metal stud that doesn't mean it's a good ground. So I told you I was going to check the computer grounds and not the powers to save time. But I need to check at least one power, and the reason I'm doing that, I'll show you that on the meter, the reason I'm checking this power is I want to make sure, not so much that I have power there because I already tested it, but I'm testing my ground on my meter. So now I can be confident and whatever I read on these grounds is going to be an accurate voltage reading. Some of you prefer to do ohm tests on circuit grounds. I definitely prefer to do voltage tests. So I'm going to do a voltage drop test on the computer grounds. I already have one T-pin and, and 
instead of showing you all of them, I'm really just going to focus on this one because you're going to see where our problem's at when I do. So that is one of my computer grounds. And that is one crazy looking computer ground signal, isn't it? We got some crazy stuff going on on this. As far as min max voltage readings go, I can do that for you just to get an idea of what we're talking about. Now I can't use this bottom scale right now. I have to refresh that. So let me reset my min max scales here. And this would be my sensor ground, computer grounds. 8 volts at the peak, minus 3 volts on the valley. And I have to tell you guys that every single one of these grounds is showing the same pattern, except for the case ground. The case ground is a separate circuit, not shared. Case ground shows good voltage. I'm not going to walk you through all that. We have a computer ground problem on this car, no question about it. So, where does all this tie together? Well, the engine was replaced. And the problem started after the engine was replaced. These grounds go to the engine. So, our next step is going to be to locate this bad ground under the hood and see what we find. Okay, so we're checking these grounds on the block, these computer grounds, we located them. And you can see that there are two groups, two eyelets that go to that bolt, to this aluminum housing, looks like thermostat housing. And thermostat housing looks pretty corroded. Remember, this was a junkyard engine. That bolt is tight. And what we want to do is take a voltage reading right here and see what we have. If we have good voltage here and bad at the computer inside, then that means that we have an open in the harness somewhere. But we're going to take a voltage reading right here. I'm just going to take this yellow lead and connect it to the eyelet. Okay, just to be clear, I'm not on that bolt. I'm on the eyelet itself. And take a look at my multimeter. That is pretty cool. So what that means is there is no problem at all in this harness that our ground is bad all the way out here. And I'm betting on we take that bolt off, clean up this corroded aluminum housing from sitting in a junkyard, and we're going to fix this problem. Uh, we can do one more voltage reading, and that's on the bolt itself or the housing itself. See what the housing reads. And that would be just clipped on the bolt and you see that that is a good ground at that point so even though those connections are tight and that bolt is tight those are bad grounds okay I didn't think I was going to have the opportunity to show this but I do and I'm trying to save some time. I'm using a different meter instead of bringing the Varus all the way in here. I'm just using my regular multimeter. I'm using that same ground location underneath. Uh, using a jumper wire because I do not have alligator clips on my ohm meter. No big deal. And looking at my ohm meter screen, I'm going to take this to show you I'm not lying to you. And I'm just going to touch something else metal on the car. I'll just come over here to the seat and I'll touch on this and I'll show you that that I get a reading of zero ohms of resistance I got a bad connection here hang on so you see I'm at 0 0.2 0 0.1 so no resistance you see my meter is connected keep in mind what I told you guys we have a bad ground and manufacturer flowcharts always have you check computer grounds with an ohm meter a lot of people in the field swear by the ohm meter. I've actually gotten people that have given me a hard time about doing voltage tests. Why don't you use an ohm meter? Well, this is the perfect reason why. Computers unplugged, when you do ohm tests, we want to make sure the circuit's isolated. And I'm on just one of my ground wires that we proved is bad. So I'm touching on that ground. Let's look at the meter. 
So I'm OL right now on the mega ohm scale. That's a, a complete open. Touch on my T pin and we read zero ohms. You see that that is on ohms, not mega ohms. We're reading zero ohms of resistance on a bad computer ground. Do we need to do voltage drop tests? Yes, we do. Does the circuit need to, need to be loaded? Yes, it does. A ohm meter can be misleading on higher current circuits. And you can see on this case, you might think a computer ground is not a high current circuit. Well, guess what? The ohm meter is even inaccurate on computer grounds. Voltage drop, voltmeter is the answer. Okay, I want to cover one variable that's in here that I know that I'm going to get questions on from you guys. And that is why we chose to check the grounds on this data link connector with an ohm meter instead of a voltmeter. So I showed you the downside of the ohm meter, which is we had a bad ground that had zero ohms of resistance using the ohm meter. And we had to do a voltage drop test to catch that problem. And so what might happen is you guys might think that I'm saying never use the ohm meter and I am not saying that. We chose to use the ohm meter here, number one, because we were told to, but you know, that's not a good reason because I just told you that engineer flow charts have you check computer grounds with an ohm meter and that isn't always accurate. But if you look at this diagram, we were checking pin four and pin five with an ohm meter connected to ground. And what we saw on that was zero ohms on each. Can we rely on that? Can we use a voltmeter on these? And what I'm saying is we probably should not. If let, let's look at number five first, pin five. I'll just draw it. Pin five is this brown wire. If you follow this wire, it goes straight to ground. There's nothing else tied into this circuit. If you have the data link connector unplugged and you're measuring that wire for voltage, there's never going to be voltage on that wire. You can't do a voltage drop test on that wire because there's never current flow on that wire unless you're plugged into the data link connector with the scan tool. So even if this circuit was broken on pin 5, let's say that this ground was open here and you're measuring voltage with a voltmeter like we did on the computer grounds, it's still going to read zero volts because there's nothing else in here. So when you check pin 5, we need to measure it with an ohm meter because the circuit cannot be loaded. So there's a good defense of when you'd want to use an ohm meter. We did measure one of the other circuits pin 4. Actually, we did both of them at first, pin 4 and 5 with the voltmeter. And then we saw the diagram and what was involved, and that's why we switched it. Pin 4, if you follow pin 4, it's white-black. Pin 4 on this diagram shows a splice. And what that tells me right there, and I don't have the complete part of this diagram, but that tells me something else is shared in here. Pin 4, you might be able to get away with doing the voltage drop test on because that circuit's loaded from other components. But in any case, you follow it where it goes. Left kick panel, totally different area from where we are in our computer grounds. So just because that ground's good doesn't mean your computer grounds are good, I guess would be the lesson there. This G. 115 ground was in our area, but not the same location. So the main point with this, if you have a circuit that cannot be loaded, then you can't do a voltage drop test on it. So there are times to use the ohm meter. But I, can, I have to remind you that the ohm meter is not an accurate tool for circuits that carry any measurable amount of current flow. And I know that previously I said that high amp circuits, the ohm meter isn't accurate on. Certainly that's true. You might think a computer ground is not a high amp circuit. 
And I just proved to you that even a computer ground measuring with an ohm meter can be inaccurate. There's enough amperage on that circuit to cause that condition. So just to review again, when you want to use an ohm meter, when you don't want to use an ohm meter, and I think it's very valuable to have. Okay, so back under the hood showing you this bad ground with a voltage reading. So the next step is going to be to clean up this ground, put it back together, see how this car runs, see how it communicates, and then I want to do one final shot, which is I'll show you what the communication signal actually looks like with a good ground. We need to know what the signal should look like. And uh, wow, we just had some characteristic changes there, but doesn't change that this is a bad ground. Okay, so one last quick shot of this voltage reading on this ground. And you see we're hovering between 4 and 6 volts, 4 and 7 volts on this ground. A lot of the activity and the up-down movements in there would be different components the computer's trying to control or run. Basically, variable current amounts is what's causing that. You see the characteristics of that just changed again. All kinds of crazy noise on that ground. I'm going to take that bolt, I'm going to loosen it, tighten it back up just to show you the fix on this. And really what needs to happen is that bolt has to come out. We need to clean this housing very well and then bolt it back up. All right, I got the bolt loose enough right now to show you that when I wiggle this, I can actually make this thing make a decent ground, at least for a period of time. You know, kind of weird noises and clicking going on, but if I pull on that, that's much better. That's more what we want to see on this ground. Certainly not that right there. I'll get you a shot of it when we're all done. All right, I had to get a shot of this before I clean it. The eyelet itself has some rust on it, but I'm not too worried about that. It's the backside that we're worried about, right where it bolts to this thermostat housing or whatever part of the intake this is. I guess this is a lesson learned. You get an engine from a salvage yard, you better clean up the ground points before you bolt them up. And that was our resistance in this circuit. That was causing all of his problems. Okay, here's the after. I just used a screwdriver and just scraped all the crap off. I wish I could have shown that all the white powdery stuff that was coming off of there. That was pretty cool. But this is going to be a fix. I'll bolt it up, show you the scope. Okay, here's our after shot after tighten that back up. I have the yellow lead on the ground eyelet. Again, black lead on a known good ground for my meter. We're at zero volts. Certainly we want to have the key on. The key is on. I'll turn the key on and off a couple times. There's key off. There's key on. I see no change at all. One of the things about doing ground to ground voltage tests is are you connected? And that is a concern that I have, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this voltage scale. We'll go down to 1 volt, and what I want to see is at least some type of change. We'll look at this live number, this 0 .008. Let me turn the key off, and that number should drop. So that's with the circuit unloaded. That is not a good test. Turn the key on. and we see some activity there. The other thing that you can do too is you can crank it, which is gonna load the ground even more. And the rest of this stuff, just normal block ground noise. You're looking at 0.07. I see no problem with that. I've told you guys in other videos that we don't wanna do cranking. See how high that voltage got on the block there momentarily on a crank. But let me increase the time base to show you. We'll go to like five seconds. You do cranking circuit tests to be misleading. And that is completely normal. I've talked about this before. That what you're looking at in this picture here is actually starter current loading the block with all kinds of amperage and all of your block ground voltage levels and numbers are going to rise during that event. So we don't want to do cranking circuit voltage drop tests on a computer ground. 
basically what I'm showing you is ways to determine that you are in fact on that ground and that is a good ground. So one more time when we do this, we just want to look at the average number in the middle of that min max caster. Turn the key on. This is all we were doing before. I'm okay with those little voltage spikes that are in there. 0 0.008, where were we before? Two, four, six volts on that computer ground. That is a fix. I'm going to start the car. Let's see what that light looks like. Remember the check engine light was kind of flashing on and off. It's got a little rattle in the car. We have a exhaust that's hitting on the underside of the car a little bit. This thing is running very smooth. I don't see that light flickering on and off. Let me rev it up a couple times. All right, that's a good thing. Now, of course, the check engine light is still on, so we have a stored trouble code. Let's see if we can communicate with this system now and see what we got. I have the vehicle loaded up. I'm going to display the codes. Go history. And we are communicating. And the code is a power steering pressure circuit fault. We could do that in a different video. I'm not going to go any further with that right now. Go current. And I cleared them and that, that fault's there. So that this check engine light is going to continue to be on until we take care of that. Let me start it and see. Yeah, you see our light's still on. So I'm going to have to take care of that code for him before we let this car go, but that is a fix. Let me show you one more thing, and that's our data link connector signal. Okay, this is our pin 7 data bus signal. You see it's fixed at around 11 volts right now. I don't know what's normal on this. Let's cycle the key a couple times. See if we get some kind of pulsing. There's one. Start the car. And I certainly don't see any pulsing in there. I'm not sure how you can use that as a diagnostic process. I mean, there's one there. But let me show you what it looks like when I'm communicating with the scan tool. What I'm going to do is go to our data display, which will force a pretty much constant communication between the engine computer and my scan tool. And then I'll go back and show you what that signal looks like while I'm communicating. All right, so I'm talking to the car now. Go back to my scope, and you see during data transmission that we have a lot of, a lot of activity there. And I'm going to want to peak detect this one. And my time base is all wrong for viewing something like this. So there's kind of an idea of what this data network looks like zeros and ones in this case surprisingly it's zero to around 11 volts with the key on with this communicating but man nowhere in that flow chart did it tell you to do that it just said look for a pulsing signal it didn't say when if I stop communicating with this computer now let's go back and look at it in a little bit longer time base for a minute just to give you an idea of data network and what's going on in here I'll stop communicating now. Go back to scope. And that's the data bus while I'm not communicating with this engine computer. So I don't know. I don't know if that helps you guys or not. The Flowchart didn't really direct me to put the scan tool on it and check it. Now you see why I back probed pin 7 instead of looking at the front side of it. Then one other thing too is this network, this data bus, you can communicate with other modules on this bus too. And the other module that we found was the airbag module. And we were actually not able to talk to it either. So that's it. That's the data bus. 
communicating with the scan tool and not communicating, we need to look at this power steering pressure switch code. See what's going on with that to get rid of this check engine light. But this vehicle is a fix. I'll let you hear it one more time. Runs good. It revs good. Let's read our codes one more time. And there's that power steering pressure switch circuit fault. I need to take care of that. There's also some other little things. You know, this car has been been through a lot. That blue temperature light is still on. I don't like that either. So, I mean, this is good enough for the video and what I've shown with a bad computer ground that that is the main problem with this car. There's a few other things that's going to need before we can let this car go, but I'm happy with that fix. So I hope you guys like that. Just to review what we did, did a no communication problem. Every car is going to be a little bit different on how you handle that. We did some computer power and ground checks using a voltmeter, using an ohmmeter, compared the ohmmeter, compared the voltmeter, when to use it, when not to use it, and hopefully you guys learned from that. Thanks a lot.